This is the OGM weekly call on Thursday, January 18th, 2024. We are gathered here in the uh, spirit of check-in because we alternate formats and this week is a check-in format. Uh, I will wait until a couple more people join us. In the meantime, anybody who'd like to make small talk, please do so. Um, I learned from a friend who is a historian of what well, is a historian of many things, including early British roads and turnpikes, <clears throat> that small talk seems to have been invented, uh, at least in England, when the turnpikes showed up, because now you could take carriages and travel with other people in an enclosed container for a long distance. So you had to sort of make things up to say, because before that, if you were on the road, everybody had their own horse or cart or whatever, and you were a separate traveling party. So you knew everybody you were traveling with. And all of a sudden you were near strangers. So it was like, oh, nice weather we're having. Wasn't a thing before, before that. And that's just a theory, but you can take it for what it's worth. it's apparently not a thing here too jerry <laughs> <laughs> wait no go. it is a it is a thing it is a thing well small talk like we thing. all engage like elevators right if it except many people no longer talk so that's non-talk my Isn't wife is that astonished that i can actually start up a conversation while waiting in line for the restroom on an airplane, which is like the least small talk environment possible. And yet I do it. <laughs> Pretty inhospitable, but there you are. Well, you know, talk about captive audience. <laughs> I usually start those conversations with hi. That's, that's a bad joke. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for English. So many yeah. homonyms, so many puns. Is English the punniest language? No question about it. Just because we've put so many different languages together. Although the Chinese are pretty good at it too, because they have all these sounds that are the same, except it's homonyms, Li. Or homo Li. homophones? Is it homophones or homonyms? Homophones. Those uh, are... Words that not... sound alike but have different meanings? Homonyms are words that sound alike but are spelled differently and homophones are things that are that sound the same but might have different meanings cool and then there's mononyms and there's obviously synonyms and antonyms in another life i would be a linguist yeah exactly if there were any path in a career who knows um so we are that would in... be that would be a good discussion sometimes is what 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 career choice could have you taken would have you taken might have you taken uh, if money did not matter would be a nice addition to that ah uh, yes i mean I, I think that you know lots of people's choices about what they would have done are still colored by 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 that so who knows i will commence our check-in round explaining the rules very lightly. Um, please step in only once during the check-in round. Use your electronic hand to step into the queue, or if nobody has their hand up, you can step in. Um, we will use the chat minimally during check-in. Uh, I will use it to explain if we have a newbie who doesn't know what we're doing uh, and put them into the dance. But otherwise, I will step out and not step back in unless I'm really needed do anything so just uh please uh, take a moment take a beat before you step in uh, part of the fun of check-in rounds these days is the pauses between the check-ins which sometimes cause our calls to feel a little bit more like quaker meeting than a busy zoom call which is a feature not a bug um with that i will step to the periphery and see who would like to jump in whenever they would like to jump in
I will boldly step in, partly because I'm only here for the first 30 minutes. I unfortunately, have to go to something else. Um, I have been um, growing increasingly frustrated with the amount of information out there to assimilate, at least in the areas that I care about, and I care about more and more things. Um, this week is always particularly challenging because this is the week of the World Economic Forum in Davos, and they are showing some amazingly useful panels, uh, particularly on artificial intelligence and the digital transformation, which is something I track pretty closely. And unlike most high-level panels at places like Davos, these AI panels have been incredibly useful. Um, my record, at least my experience, is that 90% of these panels on AI are the uninformed talking to the uninformed and everybody walking away less informed or actually misinformed. Um, these have been really good. And not just they're not just corporate people like Sam Altman and the CEO of IBM. Um, we had the AI minister of UAE. But my, as I say, my frustration is that the, the amount of knowledge is growing. And so the leading edge of knowledge is getting bigger and bigger. And I'm more and more of a generalist and I'm supposed to know more and more about more and more. And I'm just getting quite overwhelmed because I'm also supposed to take some time and share my insights with people. And I have not got that balance right. I'm not writing nearly as much as I should. And I'm... Um, behind on a couple of big projects and that's driving me a little crazy. Um, but the other thing that's driving me crazy is the incredible distraction of this election, which will only, I, I think will only get worse. Um, I tried to avoid all of the Iowa caucuses coverage because even though I'm inside the beltway, I am very aware that we were watching 120,000 people decide who they thought the next Republican nominee could be. And these people are self-selected. They're certifiably crazy because they went out when there was a minus 10 wind chill on icy roads. And uh, it was also clear they're certifiably crazy because when they interviewed these people, 60 or 70% of them thought that Biden was not elected legitimately, however legitimately was defined. So I'm, I'm, very stressed out about the impact of disinformation. I'm stressed out about the fact that our news media is completely focused on the wrong things. And i um, very frustrated with the fact that I'm working at a think tank. Our goal is to work on the big issues and the long-term problems. And the better the analysis I write, the less likely it is that it'll be read, consumed, and have an impact. I'm getting lots of hand signals from Jerry here, so I will uh, share my frustrations. Uh, and now I'll spend one minute sharing the joys. Um, Kathleen was on a long trip. Well, it was supposed to be a short trip to California because of the United, uh, because of United having a bunch of Boeing seven thirty seven Max aircraft, and because of the terrible weather. She left a day late and she got back two days late. So I'm very happy she's back. She came back with a miserable, terrible sinus infection and or bronchitis, but I'm happy that she's getting better. And um, I hear her coughing as she walks up the stairs right now. So that's where I'm at. Um, and I'm very excited about going out to California, Palm Springs, and then up to uh, Seattle uh, starting a week from Friday. So, thank you. Maybe I'll go. I'll go next here. Um, I've also listened in on the World Economic Forum, um, and of course, what uh, stood out for me was that uh, um, Blinken did a presentation on soil and uh, at a workshop explaining for the first time ever 
you know, that uh, without healthy soil, the planet simply cannot survive. And so the linkage between the natural world and the biosphere and the way we farm um, was center part of his conversation. So that was <clears throat> encouraging. Um, what's not so encouraging is that the solutions that were uh, discussed at the World Economic Forum over the last few years, you know, guided by McKinsey, uh, were all techno focused, and none of them uh, ever paid any attention to the socioeconomic impacts of their decisions, which may, which just dooms them to fail from the from the start, right? Because now, as you change the food system, it's changing jobs, it uh, uh, requires different skill sets, it requires a different supply chain configuration, it requires changing of menus and things of that sort, which so far uh, has not been uh, acknowledged. So it's encouraging to see that at least the need for change uh, is uh, on the table now. And the question then is now, so where does it go? So my partner and I hosted uh, a meeting. We had a uh, uh, very diverse uh, uh, group of senior little people at the table or at the Zoom. Um, and there were two NGOs uh, represented who are very active uh, and, and who have you know big impact in their particular regions, one from Oregon, one from Idaho. Um, there, were, there was a seat call. Where uh, people who are um, international, it's a subsidiary of Siemens. They, they have just an amazing technology to use uh, food scraps and leftovers to uh, make powder products, you know, protein extracts and things of that sort. So, so we the point of this was to let everybody talk and realize that there's so much going on already. Uh, around them and uh, uh, developing tools and process structures that are really exciting, but there is no good mechanism to get this information around and to help people see what's already there and find uh, uh, partners to connect with who um, who have complementary products, uh, services, and, and knowledge. Yeah. So that's uh, so we are we are now. Now, uh, also using AI you know, to extract how much uh, can we get out of this meeting and and uh, uh, make that uh, um, understandable, you know, going going forward. And then, of course, I totally share Mike's uh, <laughs> fear and frustration uh, about uh, um, the political process. I think in the farm community, we have a real opportunity. About, I would say, two-thirds of farmers vote uh, uh, for Trump. Yeah. Uh, empathically, I mean, with, with, with vigor. Yeah. And uh, if you ask them why, they don't really, they can't really explain uh, a lot of the technical reasons. But the... The um, regulatory process and uh, the 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 way that our uh, market rules are defined makes it very difficult for farmers to make a living uh, and to get fairly compensated, and it forces them to do things to their land that is just harmful. You know, that's just destructive on their soils and their watersheds, and so the the um, but at the same time, the Biden administration has done an amazing job. You know, this, the uh, Secretary of Agriculture, Vilsack, have done an amazing job to open up um, funding and expertise to assist farmers to change. Um, the hang up now uh, is access to markets. And this is the, um, I think, the challenge that goes throughout the entire uh, economy, wanting to change, you know, wanting to make structural changes like you have in the electricity sector. In the food sector, it's it's newer because the conversation about um, the environmental impact of food and agriculture is, is not as old and mature as it is in the energy sector. Um, but it's coming on 
rapidly. Uh, so the and the capacity to make changes in the food system, if you get people excited you know, about the, the potential impact of changing our uh, buying patterns and our dietary habits uh, is, is amazing. You know? So that's a communications challenge um, to, to get that out and then to provide products into that market that are uh, regenerative, attractive, you know, and, and fun to work with. So anyway, the, the, I don't think there is a political solution to this. You know, I don't know what you could talk uh, about with farmers, uh, and, and, um, uh, people who are, you know, in the, in the, um, let's say working environment, um, it has to it has to be actions it has to be action focused now it has to be practical and and then you have this insane food fight you know in congress for example in the in in the agriculture sector uh, the ira the inflation reduction act has allocated you now 20 billion dollars to go to conservation programs for farmers which would be a total game changer it's the first ever federal investment uh, into climate change at scale into the into the agricultural sector, and the the fight over this is absolutely incredible. You know? So we are mobilizing our networks to to reach out and talk with farmers and and engage them into a very practical conversation about farming, not about politics, but about farming, um, and and just. Um, you know, you you can't you can't debate on the wavelength that the that Trump and you know, his his uh, uh, cohorts there are communicating at because you know I don't know who said some famous person once said you know you never want to argue with stupid because it's going to pull you into the mud and then beat you with experience um, and and so so there's no it, it makes no sense you know and I think all of us have engaged into some conversations there and you realize how how fruitless that is so we just have to change the conversation you know and and move it into a practical sphere where it matters to people you know, uh, uh, like for a farmer for example to get access to markets by creating a product line that is totally regenerative and uh, and and allows him to recover his soil and to and make it profitable so, so that was a long one, yeah. But that's that's sort of. Uh, um, uh, I think we're in a really challenging time. We then will better figure this out, but, you know. So that's sort of where I'm at. Um, I will check in. I also have to go here in a few minutes at the half hour mark. Um, I have been in Illinois for a few days now. Um, I've been quite closely involved in a uh, caretaking situation for a loved one who is uh, currently moving through a mental illness challenge. And I have been um, pretty involved in this for the last month or so. And really struck by um, how much time and resources are needed for supporting someone who is in who is moving through uh, moving through a situation like this. And while I'm I'm exceptionally happy to be here, and I'm here of choice, and I um, am. Just yeah, I'm really I'm really glad to be here. I, I keep I can't help but think about the uh, if anyone here has read the book Power Versus Force by um, uh, David Hawkins, he has this framework, this idea of understanding the uh, role of emotional, the role of um, 
the impact that our emotional, internalized emotional processes kind of play on how the rest of the world is in balance or out of balance or how the communities or people around us, how we affect them. And he suggests that uh, there's that emotions, each identified emotion kind of calibrates at a certain um, a numerical value. And he suggests, and someone can check me on this if I'm wrong, uh, I think he suggests that when the calibration of an emotion is lower than this, um, I think it's a logarithmic scale of the number 300. So this is emotions like shame or anger or guilt or pride. Uh, we individuals who calibrate at that um, at that level tend to take energy from the world. And once we hit this um, this this certain numerical value of 300, and we are uh, calibrated to these emotional states that are of, um, of at or above the number 300, we can give energy to the world. And as I'm, you know, watching this situation and involved in this situation at the micro level, I'm also very closely um, following what has been unfolding in Palestine. I can't help but I'm just very conscious of that right now, of this idea. And while I don't necessarily agree with the methods that David Hawkins used to um, uh, formulate this idea. I think it's a really interesting, it's a really interesting concept. And I, I just am struck again and again by how much our, uh, unprocessed collective pain is causing the planet, um, at the planetary level, at the level of resources, at the level of humanity and all life on the planet. And I think I am struggling to, uh, come back to hope within myself. Um, I'm also not taking as great of care of myself, especially, you know, I'm out of my own environment right now, my own patterns and routine. And I, and I trust that this is also impacting how, how hopeful I can feel. And so I am really present to the importance of taking care of oneself when holding and navigating and being in support of any way to a larger process than that of my own. And, um, it just feels really intense right now. I'm very present to it. And I feel complete. I don't have a whole lot to report, um, but I do have a couple of things. One, um, Gil and I hosted Hunter Levins yesterday on our call. I know Jerry was there. I know Hank was there. I don't know if anybody else was there, but it was just woman is a force of nature. I mean, I, she just sits there and pulls fact after she's a walking encyclopedia of of um, sustainability and, and and systems thinking and it just it was really amazing to to watch her we talked a lot about what happened at cop she said you know it's the un's annual exercise in frustration at one level nothing happens at another level a lot of really good things happened and um i, I came away just feeling very much better informed about um about why it is important she's like why why burn up all this jet fuel to go there because it is people talking maybe we don't get what we what we wanted you know but the fact that people are talking is hugely important and as someone who focuses on conversation as a way of of getting work done that to me just really resonated very deeply um we'll have that video posted probably in the next week or 10 days and um i'll, I'll make sure that send it out to the ogm list highly recommend you take a look at it it's, it's very inspiring um and it just I like Hunter because um, she she posts things like how to combat climate despair. And I see so many people, you know, if you look at my latest post in, in Plex, it's about coping with despair. Um, and speaking of coping with despair, I'm also involved in this study group for um, 
ontological coaching. And I'm rereading a book I read 18 years ago called Ontological Coaching or Coaching the Human Soul, Ontological Coaching and Deep Change. And this thing jumped off the page at me. Um, he's talking about Alvin Toffler and Toffler's work on uh, Future Shock. And I just want to read a, a very brief excerpt here. Of, uh, Toffler focused on the human organism's physical adaptive systems and decision-making processes. Quote, dealing with a lot of changes in a short time puts an enormous challenge on the body and its coping me mechanisms may be overwhelmed. Typical responses to these situations are, and see if these resonate for you, increased anxiety and hostility to authority, an increased in, ten an increase in tendency towards violence, physical illness, depression, and apathy, erratic swings in mood, interest, and lifestyle, followed by an effort to crawl into a shell through social, intellectual, and emotional withdrawal, feeling continually bugged and harassed, and desperately wanting to reduce the number of decisions being made. He wrote this 54 years ago in 1970. And I just read that and I went, this is so present for so many people, especially on the right. I think there's all these folks who are just very hostile to authority. They just want to withdraw and go back to some mythic time that never existed. And um, I, I'm just struck by the cyclical nature of this and the long-term nature of this that, that at a collective scale, we've yet to crack the, the code on how to cope with it. So um, I'm still still working on that, along with Mike, getting frustrated of you know on all the stuff, and I'm really looking at. I've greatly reduced the amount of uh, media that I'm taking in because I just find it it produces such a dissonance in me. I can't focus on anything else. So I'm really asking myself, what is mine to do? What's important now? And how does taking in a whole bunch of media move me forward in my life? And I'm finding it really doesn't. Uh, I posted something to the list the other day, this talk by Jonathan Rosen. It's actually a little um, uh, half hour video. It's a film. It's quite lovely. It covers a lot of the same ground as Daniel Schmachtenberger, but with a much less dire and doom perspective. Um, if you want, I'll stick it in the chat here when I'm done with my check-in. I'd never heard of this guy before. He's uh, a world champion chess grandmaster. Um, he's got degrees from Harvard, Bristol, and, and um, Oxford. Uh, really amazing synthesis. And, you know, he's talking about the meta crisis and how important it is to, to recognize the meta crisis and how dire it is. And yet at the same time, he's like, I don't have a lot of faith in the political um, solutions to it, but there might be a, a consciousness shift that can go on. And I was wow, that's really fascinating. So um, half hour of your time, I think you'll you'll come away with a little bit of a less dire perspective on things and maybe a little bit more hope. Um, and if nothing else, it's a beautiful film to watch. It's interview interspersed with, with lots of great imagery. Um, so I, I throw that out there for those of you who are struggling to keep up with the, the flow here. Um, and that's me. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, Ken, would you say again about the less dire? I want I want that, but I didn't hear what it was. Yeah, I I try to follow Schmachtenberger, and I just get like really depressed. Yeah, I, the, the I, why, I, I get that. What was so, the Rosen, Jonathan Rosen, I sent you the video in the chat the other day. Okay, thank you. Watch that. That'll that'll do it. Okay, and you posted that into the into the OG. I'm and, I, and I'm going to post it right now into the chat here. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, um, God, a, a few reactions. I, I wanted to follow uh, Ken to talk about the call with Hunter yesterday, but I first want to just uh, comment on what uh, Mike said about Iowa. Uh, I did I did a rare thing the last couple of nights after watching MSNBC. Um, I spent some time on Fox News, which is, you know, a hard thing for me to do, but it was fascinating to see how similar they both were. Uh, both of them, uh, both channels were working really, really hard to spin their story. 
Uh, MSNBC was a story of this is like, you know, like, yeah, only 120,000 people, like like 20 percent of the population of a very small state. Um, and, and, you know, and, you know, and they, they were trying to construct a story about how there's a Democrat victory here. Um, and Fox was spinning a story of it is all just locked down, go home. Um, and what was notable was not the content of it, but the, the, the theater of both of them felt identical. Um, could have turned the sound off, would have been the same show. So there's that. Um, um, and um, yeah, so I, I, I live in, in, in a sense of dread uh, and a recognition of the power of organizing and people you know, actually work the issues and get folks out to vote. Things happen. So that's going to be very interesting, what, 10 and a half months uh, in front of us. Um, <clears throat> I echo everything Ken said about Hunter. Uh, I uh, we will have the video up in a few days, not a week or ten. So you know, probably by early next week at the latest, um, not sooner. Uh, and it's really worth watching. And one of the things that was really notable to me and surprising, um, I've known Hunter for decades. We've worked together. We taught together in the MBA program, Studio, done some clients together. Uh, force of nature, yeah, for sure. Well, two things. One is that she, in in her report back from COP, um, it wasn't just conversations. I mean, she, you know, hundreds of conversations with hundreds of people, and what oh, those are not just about people having chats. They're weaving the web, uh, connecting people with with projects they should be involved in, making people aware of what's going on. It's in a way the the work that we do here at OGM that a lot of us do in our lives is connecting people with possibilities. Uh, and it sounded like she was kind of full time doing that at Davos. So it didn't matter what Al Jaber said and what the document said, but the work of thousands of people being enriched by finding ways to work together uh, was really stunning. Uh, and one example, and Klaus, this is relevant for you. I think you, you were on the call, I think, weren't you? I think I saw you there in the tiles. Um, was she um, took one of the leadership of one of the Gulf states um, out into the desert, um, uh, Hunter's been doing a lot of work on regenerative agriculture um, and exposed this guy, I don't know what the whole story was, to the, to the realization that the land that he was looking at as desert used to be grassland. And he'd never known that before and never imagined that before and saw a possibility for a new future for agriculture in a Gulf state, in the desert lands of the Middle East. Um, and so, you know, just small encounters like that, uh, offering up the sense of the possible, because, some, you know, something has existed, it, it, it may be as possible again. So that was all rich and inspiring. There's a wealth in the call. But the thing that shocked me was she said that, um, you know, we've been working at this for decades, trying to change companies and the economy and so forth, and we're going, and we're losing. You know, the vital signs are going in the wrong direction. Um, which, you know, we've heard many times from many people, but then this in, person who's been dedicated since like her teenager full time to this stuff said, I'm thinking about hanging up my spurs. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about declaring defeat and just going riding horses and running my ranch. Um, I was really surprised to hear that from her. Uh, she also said that that's not what she's doing. <laughs> no, she's staying in the game. Uh, but it's another another perspective on the despair that uh, Patty was talking about. And somehow, um, you know, I guess some people do give it up and some people stay in the game. Um, Gil, do you remember her answer to why when you said why didn't you hang up your spurs? Do you remember her answer? Uh, I don't. So, But I know you do. Because um, Guterres gave a speech on regenerative agriculture. She said, I could have given that speech. I got to get back in here. She says, I'm not giving up yet. This is yep. actually the words getting out. Yep. And it's both that she could have given that speech and also that, you know, people are picking up on her work and the work of class and the work of others. It's, you know, it's, it's a slow and strange process. Uh, but we do see shifts in the narrative because of the, you know, the thankless, invisible work that thousands of us are doing all the time. And uh, it's a reminder that we don't know very much about cause and effect. You know, everybody talks about theories of change, but nobody really knows how change happens. Uh, but it does. And so we do what we do. And, um, you know, it's not like um, 
Jane and I have been watching lots of house building programs uh, on the TV, much, much, much more better than news. Uh, and, you know, there you, you know, you measure the thing and it fits or it doesn't. You know, you roll the truck in and it's there on time or it's not. The thing gets built or it doesn't. It stands or it does very direct feedback on certain kind of work. And we, looking at the screen, all of us, I think, if not most of us, live in a world of not direct cause and effect from our work. We do what we do. And things happen or don't. There you go. Um, I was on a call before this with Bruce, Bruce Piasecki from the AHC group back in, uh, in New York State. Bruce is a consummate uh, environmental and sustainability consultant um, who has frankly baffled me for years. He seems very unassuming, um, a lot of name dropping, um, and, um, and from my historical assessment, has been very much a moderate incrementalist, not moving the ball very much. Uh, and I'm learning that this man's been enormously effective at weaving together big players. Um, it's just come out with a book, um, which I have not read yet, called Wealth and Climate Competitiveness. How do you get Zoom cameras to work? Uh, slim book, gives a lot of, uh, a lot of bows to Henry David Thoreau and Robin Hood. Uh, and I found that this guy is, you know, a uh, uh, enormously effective as a consultant, more effective than I've been by far, and a guy with the soul of a poet. Um, and um, you know, uh, one of the he talked about, you know, talked about the stories of Robin Hood. The earliest are like twelve ninety six, from someone named Holt. Um, uh, contemporaneous with what Bruce said is one of his other heroes, Dante, who was writing about at that time about bankers going to hell, which is a spin on the Divine Comedy that I hadn't quite heard, uh, and talked about a mind shift that only fable enables, um, and how you know the Robin Hood legend has lived on in so many ways since then. But that phrase just resonated for me, so I wanted to share that. Uh, um, Mike, like you, I am not have not been writing enough. Well, I'm talking to Mike who's not here. Like, so like, perhaps like many of you, I'm not writing enough. I'm writing more. I'm trying to write more. I'm dancing a bunch uh, with the, uh, with the GPTs, uh, exploring what I can do with them, uh, how they can support the work that we're up to uh, enhance my own writing. I think I've mentioned before that we're building a couple of uh, of AIs uh, right now, one that's trained on the living between worlds conversations the past four years, um, one that's trained on my book of mm, 14 years ago, The Truth About Green Business, which we're in, uh, interested in, in updating. And uh, Pete and I have been having a little bit of a chat about neobooking the thing uh, in a kind of open source process of inviting the world to help us update it. The book was written uh, uh, principle based and designed to be timeless, but the examples are not timeless. Uh, so the examples need refreshing and there are themes that we didn't see in 2009 that are front and center now. So um, interested in how, uh, I guess with both of these, how we can use these technologies, not just to create artifacts, but to enrich the conversation and interaction among people. Uh, very, very rich conversation on the call yesterday, not just Hunter's brilliance, uh, but the the chat was more full than I've ever seen it. I uh, can I think one of our jobs in the next week or so is to wander through the chat and digest it and pull nuggets out from there. I think there's a lot to do there. Um, and um, what else? Yeah, other GPT stuff, which I'm not ready to talk about yet, but I will in future sessions. And um, um, just thank you all for this group. This is one of a, I, don't know, I guess about a half a dozen um, uh, regular conversations I have on the Zoom. Uh, and I really look forward to this and spending time with you and being enriched by these conversations. So thank you. I'm done.
I, I have to go momentarily, but um, I'm, I'm finding myself treading into waters sort of beyond cybernetics and what's old is new again. So I'm, I've been up to my Nate, neck and Pete and Bateson and Bohm and um, and um, and immersed in the elements, which is a really ancient um, fundamental <laughs> um, as a contrast to all of that. And um, and getting to something simpler as a way of um, of catalyzing and metamorphosing uh, people's consciousness and orientation, and um, and I'm seeing sort of really a common theme across all of the all of the shares today. Um, in, in a way of looking at it, not as the chaos and the maelstrom end of the telescope, but as the um, other end, which is everything is connected. And everything is working off one source. And um, the closer the conversation is to where an individual lives in a relational, energetic, emotional um, way, um, the opener they are to learning and to connection and to sharing. And uh, and just as a touchstone, I know we're in check-in mode, but class, I've had like bump ups against farmers over the years in different contexts and live in the middle of them here where I am now. Um, and they're deep when you talk to them about things farming, like your comment about that, like when you, get into the reality of farming, not the anything matter or abstract. Um, they're fully present, accounted for, interested, curious, in learning, open, receptive. And um, I think that's sort of true with all of the constituencies that are at each other's throats. And with that, I'm complete. So um, I'll have a short check-in today, and um, it'll be interesting to follow Doug. Um, Ken, I want to thank you for sending that video out of, of Rosen. Um, it's just extraordinary. Um, when I stop um, being a human doing and get a little quiet, uh, I find myself... Um, whimpering a bit, you know, like an animal whimpers um, because there's so much going on. Um, so much going on. And I think I'm just exhausted in a certain way. And, and that video really says it all. 
you know, if we think about the field that we're in and what we're all dealing with and what we're all tilting at in terms of trying to make sense of stuff that doesn't make sense and trying to create solutions for a species um, on a planet that, you know, we're, we're in process of, 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 um, of killing in some ways or have killed in some ways or have, have certainly damaged or wounded. Um, and I guess speaking, um, that whimpering is my own woundedness as, as a reflection or an embodiment of the woundedness that we're all living in. And the, and the, and the, and the only real consolation, and it's interesting, and I keep being you know, one of the few who raises the, the human element um, the question that I asked the hunter yesterday, which, you know, turned the conversation a little bit, I think from the engineering solutions into the human element, I just wanted to make sure that that was kind of dropped into the conversation. It was a brilliant and wonderful um, um, coming together that you guys created, um, um, Gil and Kim. Um, But understanding the context that we're in is what the Rosen um, video, uh, you know, brought up. Um, and maybe I'm the canary in the coal mine. Maybe others have more um, fortitude than I. <laughs> but the idea of making sure that we take care of, of, of ourselves and each other as we keep... Um, tilting at windmills because it's going to get worse before it might get better so that's my check-in today I have a short check-in as well. I was also on the call with uh, Hunt Levins uh, yesterday and uh, building on uh, what uh, Gil introduced, her rhetorical question about whether it was time to hang up her spurs and enjoy life while she can uh, is something that uh, also goes through my mind. Uh, and so far I've uh, decided very strongly that uh, it's not time to stop. But there's a question which uh, keeps me engaged. Uh, so this is a check-in and maybe someone will come back to it uh, in for their own answer in their own lives after the check-in is finished. But this is my question. Uh, if you're not going to hang up your spurs and you want to come back and either do an encore, what you've always done well and maybe do it better with more practical wisdom or maybe something completely different that you always wanted to do, when you want to engage with something important, for example, the next 10 years of your life, should you do what's within your comfort zone? Should you do what you know you can get accomplished? Or should you be more like Don Quixote uh, and try to engage with something that's really difficult, that's almost impossible uh, because it's not being done enough and you think with your little contribution of energy, it can move uh, uh, move the world a bit forward in that direction. So 
come back and improve your comfort zone or go for something which everyone thinks is impossible. And aside from that, I have a question. Uh, as many of you know, I'm uh, originally an American and I've lived the last 50 four years outside of America. So I don't understand everything that's going on there. Uh, and I don't want to talk about why people seem to like Trump. I, I'm just completely amazed why nobody acknowledges the job that Biden's doing. Well, I'm uh, how she did earlier in this call, but I mean, in American politics in American media, at least what gets reported over here in Europe, it seems nobody thinks he's capable of doing a good job. Whereas to my innocent eyes, being a couple of thousand miles away from it, it seems he's doing lots of good things. So that's another question I'm posing for possibly after the check-in round. Thank you. All right, I guess uh, I'm in. Um, Hank, go for what you think is poss impossible, I think is what's resonating for me because this will tie into the comment I was gonna make. One of my thoughts a couple of years ago was that infinity is too much. And it was something that we were dealing with. Um, the human body and mind is limited and we have suddenly become, tried to take on global individually, as Stuart was talking about, whimpering, um, which I'll comment in a second, Stuart, because I had a very interesting thing that sparked from that. So Hank, instead of what everyone thinks is impossible, why not go after something that you think might be impossible, which might be possible because it's it's smaller, it's human scaled. And that's what I've been trying to do. I believe, Gil, what you were talking about writing more, I believe writing is thinking as the reason to do it, which is why I do not use chat GPT for any of my writing because I am, it's like having someone else do the push-ups for me. Like it's, okay, the, the, the work is getting done, but I going through the process is what's developing me. And writing for me is developing myself more than producing a final product. So I can produce a final product using those tools, but that's not, not the purpose for me. So um, Stuart, when we're, you're talking about this whimpering, which I think was a wonderful wonderful word that I haven't heard in many, I haven't heard that in a long time. And thinking about this idea of infinity being too much. Um, is there more going on or have we just increased our individual fields beyond our human individual capacity? By field, I mean field of awareness. And so when you described whimpering, I was thinking of the, the, the vision that's presented as staring at the face of God, blinded, overwhelmed, whimpering, in awe, in just you can't even comprehend, which is how it's, I've seen it written in many ways. And I think no matter how you conceptualize it, it's what's bigger than us. It you know, and and if if God is a is an entity, is a conceptualization of reality, is a 
uh, personification of everything. I'm a person. I'm one person. How can I face that and not whimper? And I think that's where this constraining is so vital to say, I understand that there's problems that are global, but to try to carry that is in some ways admirable, but it's also maybe foolish and maybe a little beyond what we as individuals can hope to do. So instead of trying to do something that would be impossible or seem impossible for the entire human race to pull together, why not take on something that seems beyond my own capabilities, which is currently technically impossible for myself until I achieve it. But it's something that I could hope to achieve as opposed to that uh, that scale. So that's um, that's my thought. I guess it's my check in. I'm just uh, feel like I'm churning uh, a lot of ways. Uh, got the gas pedal stuck and uh, the car's in neutral and just vibrating and things. So, uh, hearing people talk, I was reminded there's a David G. Allen, that, uh, not the getting things done guy, but uh, patience is the calm acceptance that things can happen in a different order than the one you have in mind, which is kind of several things like that that are kind of like um, kind of mantras is um, op open space technology also has some whatever happens is the only thing that could happen. So I'm just trying to try your best and um, so uh, today's, well, yesterday was actually pitch on uh, New Year's resolution day. So if you are serious about it, making any changes, today's the day to start. <laughs> and, you know, things, things. So yeah, I'm just really trying to get um, back to basics and just being more aware of how I'm using my time. And there's the various techniques like um, uh, Pomodoro technique, which is the, like setting a, like a 25 minute time block, looking at time blocking. So I think that's going to be key for me as I look to get back to uh, um, re enrolling in PhD program for the summer. And I have made a present, I made a presentation at work last week and I'm making one Saturday and just kind of look one little piece and let it kind of let the communities, let my, kind of let my um, bosses kind of set the pace. I put an idea out there, try not to get too far, too far ahead. I mean, it's like being able to delegate to people and you can delegate to people who are already doing it or really passionate about that anyway. And then they can probably take things in a way that you you could aren't capable. Those are some ideas I'm running around with. Thank you all. Um, I really appreciate the silence in between. Um, and I'll, I almost feel like I'm going a little too quick right there.
I do have to go pretty soon, so that's my my urgency. Um, <clears throat> so for those who don't know me, I, I create mindful tools that support balance. And I'm always on a search for frameworks that uh, I can share with others. And I feel like this is the right time for this one. And I'm sure a lot of you know about this framework, but it's the um, the triangulation, the drama triangle. Is anyone familiar with that? Yeah. So there's a hero, victim, villain, <clears throat> or the victim, rescuer, persecutor. And we're, um, people are often in those roles. Um, and you can tell because there's an emotional charge, a negative emotional charge in that role. Um, <clears throat> but I've noticed that Trump <laughs> plays all three roles very well. <laughs> He'll be from the victim standpoint. Oh, I'm a victim to the um, the rescuer. Well, I'm going to rescue all the victims of, you know, and I don't know. There's just a, he's he's got that down. It's very interesting. Um, also the persecutor. So I used to do um, workshops, facilitate workshops called complaint therapy years ago. And I was just, I just love going through my day and noticing, just noticing when I'm dropping into one of those roles. Um, and of course the emotions are the, the, the telltales, the telling tales. So um, I just learned recently how to flip those three roles though. So I'm just gonna share it really quickly. Um, whenever um, I'm feeling in a victim mode, like how dare they, or the world is gonna <clears throat> go down, <laughs> whatever kind of victim state I'm in, um, I can flip it to co-creator. I like, there's another word was creator, but I love co-creation instead. So the moment I, I'm feeling down, um, to change the question, as someone shared in this room just earlier, if you change the question, every the, dis, the dialogue changes. So um, what can I co-create right now is the question when I'm feeling down or angry. And the rescuer can, instead of the enabler, can turn to coach instead. How can I coach someone at this point without advising them? And then the persecutor changes to challenger. And that's a healthy version of um, bringing challenge into the room. So would love to talk about it anytime ever, ever again, if anybody wants to talk about it. I love this topic, um, but I just introduced, I wanted to introduce that into our day as we uh, drop into our day today. So, and our week going forward. Uh, at first, I thought, oh, yeah, this is the check-in day. And I'm like, oh, I don't have anything to say. Um, and then and then everybody just says everything. And then you're like, oh, my God, I have so much to say. Um, and, and it's weird because today the thing I want to say sounds so anti-me. And maybe it's not, but, but it feels like it is. Um, I'm I'm struck by this sense of how passionate we all are about whatever it is we're doing, so much so that um, we're suffering for it. And we feel the the pain the agony the 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 struggle for wanting to see things be different and wanting to get them to be better and wanting things to be something other than what they are and um and i'm 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 one of those people so that's why i'm here and i think that's why we're all here um but at the same time today i i got a different vibe which is it sounds almost religious, but uh, it's it's not because of my religion, I swear. Um, it's 
um, it's a sense of letting go of, of it, you know, do what you can do in the moment, be where you can be in the moment, support, help, serve in the moment and let go of, of the big picture stuff, because the big picture stuff is not something that any of us can do by ourselves but we can help each other and we can do the things that are in front of us. Um, and, and I think for me, the idea that we're so struck by this meta this and poly that and everything else is in part being in a place of overthinking and, and under feeling. Um, we are so stuck in this more knowledge, more information. We're going to find the solution. We're going to figure it out. Yes, yes, yes. Give me more. And it's overwhelming our emotional sides. It's overwhelming our feeling sides. And, and let's just sort of let go a bit and let, let go of, you know, I wake up most mornings. I turn, you know, turn on the news. <laughs> turn on the news, right? Um, and, uh, and and doom scroll for, you know, 20 minutes. Easy, right? Until somebody says, whoa, aren't you going to get up? <laughs> and she's right. Yeah, I need to get up. And I need to stop doing that. But, um, but then I get, going and then I start feeling and I start connecting with people and um, sometimes I actually pause from whatever agony I was in from whatever is driving me from this big picture stuff um, and actually listen to somebody and actually want to reach out and help somebody and actually want to connect with somebody and to me that that feels a lot more doable, real, and approachable um, than, than getting stuck in that space. And I think we're all there. So I don't think it's a space that, that um, any one of us has complete and utter <laughs> control over. Um, I think it's a space that we all share. So. I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can all find that ability to let go a little bit. Thank you. I want to say thank you for putting words to something I was feeling but didn't know I was feeling when you started what you just said. It was lovely about how everybody putting their stones in the pot suddenly makes it tasty and full of full of things. Um, I, I The thing that's presenting for me is I feel like I'm in the middle of a 30-year-long identity crisis that isn't really an identity crisis. I'm not sure what words to put around it, but I'm I'm curious about absolutely everything. And it's a bit of a problem because as you just said, we now have access to just about everything. And worse, uh, 26 years ago, I was infected by a tool that allows me to curate all the things about all the things I care about. And I've been doing that as a bit of a distraction with apologies to the group during this call because I'm sort of obsessive about that. And also along the path, a lot of things really clicked into place. And it's always small clicks. It's always, there's a there's a comedy book called uh, Peck to Death by Ducks. And I feel like uh, I'm sort of trying to peck the world to death by 
making little things collapse and click into place in places and trying to do that as openly as I can. But I'm I'm in the middle of a process of trying to explain who the hell I am in a clearer way uh, as part of a long-term project to figure out how actually to make a sustainable living. Um, and the, the low-hanging fruit for a person like me in that world is public speaking, which I love doing and used to do a bunch, haven't done very much lately. And I'm an old white guy. Uh, so on the one hand, I would rather have other faces on stages, but I feel like I have a lot of unique things to say. So that's not off the table. And in fact, I'm sort of heading back into that world a bit. But, but the thing that really compels me and obsesses me is trying to weave together. Uh, this came up earlier and now I'm forgetting who actually put it in the conversation. <clears throat> weave together what is and what we see and do so in a way that's not so obsessive about what we see that I forget what we feel uh, because we might be overthinking this and underfeeling it. Uh, I'll say again, thank you. Um, and I'm continually nonplussed at how primitive our tools are for actually doing this with each other. And we're way down the road on technology. Like we, I, I recently scanned output from a deck writer three of a, an econometrics program called Jaguar that I was using at UC Irvine in college because my professor, Charlie Lave, was an econometrician and we were busy trying to predict uh, how many miles people would drive in their cars for Oak Ridge National Labs in Tennessee. That was kind of what, kind of the thing I ended up doing at the end of college. And at this point, we're all talking through Zoom. We, most of us have a little slab of an Obtainium that lets us do anything we want that we underutilize like crazy. And we are busy drowning in the information torrent. And I think that there are water wings available, but at this point they're leaky and we could build rafts, but we're busy like being flown down the torrent. We're not actually um, doing enough of that in some sense. And that that is a, my sense of urgency is a piece of what's broken for us is not being able to make sense during the torrent, hence things like open global mind. Um, Anyone who's interested in this quest, I would love your feedback or help. I'm actually sort of soliciting from people who I've worked for in the past. I'm setting up interviews to go figure out like, okay, so what of the things I said or did was helpful? Uh, what works? Uh, that kind of thing. And I will come back with uh, feedback as I learn things. But I'm in the middle of that process and feeling in part daunted by it, by it in part rejuvenated by it because it's allowing me to think more clearly about what I do. And I feel I have this historic pattern where every five years or so things kind of crystallize and a new thesis shows up that builds on the old one. It doesn't replace it, but builds on the old one. So around 2010, I created the Relationship Economy Expedition. Uh, that was my living for two or three or four years. It was a mastermind group in retrospect. That's what I would call it today. But that wasn't the big thing in 2010. Uh, or I guess it, it existed. I just didn't know it existed. Um, and then it took me uh, seven, eight, nine years to realize that the common thread was trust. Uh, and then I spent some time working on trust in different ways, which uh, it doesn't sell that well. It's, it's so many problems actually come down to trust, but selling trust is like pushing a noodle up a wall. It doesn't actually work very well. Uh, and that took me into a bunch of different directions, which are too numerous to explain. But um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be in a community, this one, where I get to immerse myself in what you all are thinking and doing, and I get to share what I'm up to and trying to figure out. And it feels, I don't know, it feels good. And it feels like progress in some, in some interesting ways. And then every now and then Doug Carmichael will push us hard and say, why aren't you doing more? And I will feel those frustrations and I'll come back into what we're doing and also be motivated to try to do it more effectively and in bigger ways. And I think all of us, I think all of us help motivate one another to go back out into the field to do the thing that we're called to do and to do it with more energy and more clever solutions and whatever else. And these are, this, this is maybe a place where we share what we found and how, whether it's working or not and all of that. So I want to, I'm grateful uh, to all of you for 
your presence here and what you bring, the gifts you bring when you show up and when you open your orifices. Um, so thank you very much. And with that, I'm complete. And with that, I believe everybody has stepped into the check-in round. No. Oh, Ken. Uh, you're, uh, Gil, you're pointing that way. Uh, but Ken is over here for me. Pete, 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 Pete has his hand up. And, and Pete has his hand up. Oh, so I, Peter, for some reason, I thought you'd already gone. Uh, so my apologies. Uh, no I think worries. you were the last one. And you're over here for me. Everybody point to Pete right now. Oh, I like that. That's pretty cool. Uh, I will go quiet again with apologies. I'll take a beat. This is my check-in for today. Sometimes I try to breathe more and appreciate more. Uh, sometimes I try to center more and accept my energy and powerfulness, both within myself and with others, and use it for good. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your presence. I believe now we are all properly checked and Scott, the floor is yours. Uh, Jesse, I will echo your reminder or acknowledgement that the little gaps are delightful. Um, I think I'm, I've said it before, but I miss that in every other conversation I have in any other situation, actually. No one stops in between. It's my, my next thing, which I've been dying to say, and now I'm going to say it immediately. Um, so a uh, couple of quick thoughts. Jose, um, one of the things you mentioned was a connection between passion and suffering. And I understood what you were saying as those two things being either separate or opposite or something like that. And in my understanding is that they're the same. And people talk about passion as being this thing that I love to do. And they never talk about it. No, this is this, this is this thing that I'm I'm going to give my life to. Because if we're using our time to do something instead of doing something else, we are literally giving our life to it. And so passion and suffering, I don't think are opposites. Or if, I, if I'm suffering, then, then the passion is somehow this is not my passion or whatever. I think, no, you are, if you're doing it, even in spite of the difficulties, then that to me makes it even more aligned with passion. Um, you mentioned something about the doom scrolling in the morning, just need to get up, just, you know, and stop doing all of that. And I've said before that I think that the bigger, the bigger, the more, the more meta, the, the doom scrolling, the, which, which tends to be usually outside of our actual sphere of influence, right? I mean, that's why it stresses it out. It's so, it's bigger than us, but I've often felt that that's hiding. Because I can always say, oh, yeah, but what about food? Oh, yeah, but what about climate? Oh, yeah, but what about the political unrest in, in over here? And by doing that, I'm taking all of my potential action in my space and saying, yeah, well, you know, if there wasn't all of this, this whole world that I'm trying to fix and worry about, then I would have mental energy and lower anxiety to deal with this thing in front of me, but I don't have to deal with this thing in front of me because I'm so focused on this bigger thing and this bigger thing. So I, I've looked at that as a form of hiding and that's where I'm trying to align with that whole infinity is too much and infinity in my definition is anything beyond my 
scope, my ability. And that's technically infinity because it's beyond what I can I can count um, and what I can do. Um, Jerry, you were talking about um, how delightful this group is. And I was thinking it's so interesting because it's human scale. I can see all of you. I can count all of you. I know most of you in through this call. And to me, that's not overwhelming because it's it's this limited group. It's a room of people. And that to me feels comfortable, even when we're talking about things that are much bigger than us. Um, you know, and you were saying, can we make sense of the torrent? And I'm thinking, well, maybe we can't because it's bigger than us. And can we make sense of it individually? Sure, in our own way, but can we make sense of it as a group? I don't know. With this many people, we have this many perspectives, and that can be a, a real challenge. Um, but the one thing that you said at the end, Jerry, was something about going away and doing our thing with a renewed energy. And what I'm getting out of this call is a reminder again to, like Jose said, do your thing. Actually do it. Not everybody else's thing. Do your thing. And be able to do that with focus and joy and passion because you know that you're you're affecting something. And that to me feels way different than a call every week where I'm still focused on things that are larger than me every time. And I haven't made any progress and I don't feel like any progress is being made. And that is overwhelming to me. And so that's the one thing I have gotten about this is that resignation, I think you said, maybe it wasn't resignation, acceptance, giving, letting go and say, but by letting go, I'm also saying, but what's right here, this is mine. And I need to double down on that because that's where, that's where my agency is. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Scott. I've got um, reflections on what several of you have said. I'll go kind of in reverse order. Um, Scott, I appreciate what you're saying about the human scale of this call, having just come off a hundred person call yesterday, which was delightful in a very different way. Um, and was, you know, offered something that's not possible, you know, in any other, any other format than that kind of Zoom call, but it doesn't do things that this call does. So thank you for that. Um, Jose, um, on the on the waking up into the chaos of the world, um, the practice that um, that that I've been cultivating over the past couple of months is to wake up, and um, first thing is to pay attention to my breath and my body. Uh, and then the next thing is to dive into creative work on what calls to me right then. Uh, so that might be getting up and writing. Uh, it's actually often just lying in bed and writing, Scott, sometimes by dictation. Um, but in that liminal space of not even completely awake, not completely out of dream, to go and do what is most expressive of me. And this is thanks to um, Stephen Kotler of the Flow Research Collective. And a number of other people have suggested, and I found it transformative, both in how my day unfolds and also in what I'm able to generate. Um, and yes, Scott, this is the not GPT part. Uh, this is straight, straight out of wherever it's coming from through me. Um, um, I don't think of GPT as a final product tool. I think of it as a really good set of research assistants and lawyers and stuff who I don't have to pay anything to who could help me uncover and excavate and, you know, kind of, you know, uh, expose the pieces of something that I care about uh, and give me a richness from which I can then do my work. So um, um, uh, it's, it's still challenging to not let the news in early. 
but I think it's an enormous, for me, it's an enorm enormously important practice is to do my own day first and then news, and that includes email. Um, you know, well, if I start my day with email, I've, I've got, you know, 10 minutes or 90 minutes in reaction to other people and what they've got on their minds and what their agendas are rather than what mine is. So there's that. Um, on the matter of passion, um, thanks to my sophomore year high school English professor named Emmanuel Bloom, I've been an etymology geek my whole life. Um, and um, because I'm multilingual, I'm etymology geek in, in multiple languages and look at the differences and love to look at the differences in translations and so forth. But I, when you, Jose, when you were talking about passion, I went and checked it out. And it's a somewhat, it's a word of somewhat uncertain origin, it turns out. But what they seem to think is that it comes from the Latin, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Latin pati, which means to endure to undergo, to experience. So the notion is of passion is that which must be endured. So that was a really interesting perspective on it. Um, um, last but not least, Hank, to uh, when listening to you speak, I remember this for me wonderful quote from Buckminster Fuller, who said, the things to do are, the things that need doing, that you see need to be done, and that no one else seems to see seems to see need to be done. I want to say it again. The things to do are, I said you're going to be able to see the words this time. The things to do are the things that need doing, that you see need to be done, and that no one else seems to see need to be done. Over to you, Carl. Yeah, it's kind of interesting with the technology. I was taking notes earlier in the brain, and then it decided it was going to keep crashing on me. So it's like, okay, I should be listening more. I also did a just put into the into LinkedIn, I put in Jesse, and you popped up at the top of the list. So I, that was kind of, the technology does seem to kind of weigh, um, I guess one of the first comments we started talking about was with, and also with language and things, and I haven't done a lot of work into it, but I think one of the things that kind of makes English unique, or, or at least uh, part of its character is that it really um, spread to the vernacular with wandering minstrels and the British have such a um, uh, like wordplay is very important and it's just like all the like the British humor seems to be focused on that so I mean that like that that's um, something that intrigues me um, then as far as trying to move forward and things, I'm really trying to look at scenarios and really focusing on events. So um, kind of um, identifying different events that I want to try to uh, make happen in, in July. Um, one, I'm taking a course from Dan Rohn. He wrote a book, The Back of the Napkin. And, um, about six bestsellers, I think now, but his latest one was the pop up pitch and there's a 10, 10 page um, it's basically following the. Um, the hero's journey and things, but it's about it's all about making a persuasive. Uh, uh, argument and stuff so i'm actually looking at. Um, how I can use that for, I mean, taking a class on how to, um, a time to write your book and things. So I'm thinking in terms of those scenarios for July, kind of a, like each scenario could be a chapter. There's also um, Doug Engelbart, so I've been a huge part of my career and everything. And he'll be, um, his 99th birthday is January 30th. So there's the whole, on Doug's hundredth year coming up with culminating in 
January 30th, 2025, it's my 100th um, birthday. So um, I've been privileged to have a lot of really less, um, seminal thinkers in different areas. So maybe that, so that's what I'm toying around with, but I got to present the class on Tuesday. So <laughs> have to, things have to collapse into, into reality at some point to mount that up. That's alone, Stuart. Thanks, Carl. Uh, Stuart, you may have the uh, penultimate voice here because I'm hoping Ken might have a poem for us, but uh, we are at time. Uh, and you're muted. I'm sure Ken will have a poem. So um, very, very quickly, um, one, um, the conversation and my own check-in <clears throat> reminded me some work I did in uh, around 1990, around 30 years ago. Um, about what ultimate question drives you in your work uh, and life in the world. Um, and I was living in a question of, you know, how can I fix the world? <laughs> and, and that's going to certainly be um, exhausting and, you know, kind of change that question to how can I be a contribution to people who are trying to fix the world? Um, the other thing is in response to, you um, to Hank's stimulation is a statement from the Talmud, which makes me think about what we're grappling with is nothing new because I'm not sure when the Talmud was conceived or written. Um, uh, but before I say it, I just want to appreciate um, Scott's um, <clears throat> sharing about the face of God, which is a really... Um, interesting conception um, to create perspective for all of us. But from the Talmud, do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. <clears throat> do justly now, love mercy now, walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Stuart. Feels like a great lead in the can. So the notion of soul has come up here. Um, and soul is deeply connected to the earth. That is our connection to the earth, and that leads to soil. And so I dedicate this poem to Klaus. This is a poem from Sharon Olds called Ode to Dirt. Dear Dirt. I am sorry I slighted you. I thought that you were only the background of the leading characters, the plants and the animals and the human animals. It's as if I loved only the stars and not the sky which gave them space in which to shine. Subtle, various, sensitive. You are the skin of our terrain. You're our democracy. When I understood I had never honored you as a living equal, I was ashamed of myself as if I had not recognized a character who looks so different from me. But now I can see us all made of the same basic materials, cousins of that first exploding from nothing, our inarticulate equation together. Oh, dirt, help us find ways to serve your life. You who have brought us forth and fed us, and who at the end will take us in and rotate with us and wobble and orbit. Sharon Olds, Ode to Dirt. Klaus, you should use that with your farmer friends. Absolutely. <laughs> Klaus, read that in, for, uh, in front of your meetings. From, from dirt we come, from dirt to dirt will we return, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> soil and soul, look at the etymology. They go way back. Hummus and human, same thing. I thought it was chickpeas. Yeah. Well, there's those are there too. <laughs> yeah. Rumi writes about chickpeas being, you know, get back in the pot. <laughs> and I, I do want to say one other thing. Um, for those of you who doom scroll first thing in the morning, about 22 years ago, 2002, um, get yourself, there's it, a personal practice. I, I got a book. It happened to be Vistava Zimborska's book of collected poems. And I made it a point every morning, first thing in the morning to get up 
and read one of her poems and just contemplate it. That, I did that for an entire year. Practice poetry. Get yourself a good anthology or some poet that you like. And every day, first thing before you <laughs> read any news, read a poem and think about it and just let it sink into you. And, you know, it took for, a, a, there were only like 150 poems. So I read every poem in there at least twice in the course of that year. It's really, it's life-changing. It's a great way to begin your day. It's way better than looking at the news. That's the, that's the design of my book, Pilgrim's Path, Morning Practice for Seekers. One poem a day for every day of the year with reflective questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very nice. Got to run. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.